Murderpedia, the Encyclopedia of Murderers. Carrie Lynn Dalton was convicted and sentenced to death for the 1,988 torture and murder of Irene Melanie May in San Diego County, California, because she thought May had stolen her jewelry. She was sentenced to death on May 23, 1995. Jillian. Her daughter's side of the story. Written by Laura Pulfer. April 4, 2002. I'd heard that she had an interesting story. A sad story. One she was eager to tell because she was still angry. Jillian Hansard answered the door of her Colerain Township apartment with an exceptionally cute newborn baby tucked in the crook of one arm. Sarah, she says, born March 22. Jillian rubs her finger absently through the infant's abundant dark hair. The baby looks like her mother, she says. Mothers and daughters. That's what Jillian wants to talk about. A year ago, in a business law class at Colerain High School, Jillian was watching a taped TV show about women on California's death row. As Joan London interviewed Carrie Lynn Dalton, Jillian realized she was listening to the woman who murdered her mother. It made me feel kind of sick, she says. A perfectly understandable reaction. Before she died in 1988, Irene Louise May was beaten, stabbed, injected with battery acid and tortured with electric shocks. Jillian knew these things, having read news accounts. But she had never seen the woman convicted of the murder. Then I had to listen to her talk about how tough it was for her to be in prison, Jillian says. She said her children don't come to see her. At least, that's their choice. I have no choice. She took that away from me. It made her angry, she says, that the woman had a national audience for her complaints. They never asked me how I felt. Bad memories. Jillian was only five when her mother was killed. Her memories are not good. Addicted to drugs, Irene may often left Jillian and her two younger brothers to fend for themselves. We'd be in the bedroom, kind of hiding, and I'd try to take care of them, she says. It's hard, she says, to separate what I really remember from what I've been told over and over. She believes she sometimes begged for food. But she knows that she did her best to take care of her little brothers. My mother loved us, she says. She was trying to stay clean. She has seen records from San Diego Social Services. The children had been removed from their home, but their mother was trying to get them back. She never got the chance to be a better person. Jillian was adopted two weeks before her seventh birthday. They wouldn't let me be adopted with my brothers, she says. Because all I wanted to do was to take care of them. I thought that was my job. At age five. Now, here comes the good part. Her adoptive parents are Steve and Cinda Gorman, co-pastors of Westwood First Presbyterian Church. I came with a lot of baggage, Jillian says, but I'm proud of who I became. And I love the family I have now. This includes her husband, Charlie, a mechanic. As we talk, Sarah fusses a little, and Jillian soothes her. Competently. Kindly. A good mom, I am thinking. Child neglect, drugs, murder. A tiny girl hiding with her brothers, thinking they were her responsibility. Then taking on real responsibility as an adult. Proud of who she became. Writing her own ending to the story. Now from the murderer herself Carrie Lynn Dalton wrote to prison pen pal. I must admit up front I'm on death row. I'm sure that's gonna scare off a few folks. Perhaps if you continue to read this, I can capture just a bit of your interest. First though. My crime. I've been convicted of a murder without not only a body, but also without any weapons, nor a crime scene. Now that I've said that, I will add, this is pretty foreign to me, running an ad, fronting myself off that my burden is being lonely. I've lived a very strong free and of course wild life, which naturally landed me here. Now. I've grown in a much different style. Still of strength but also, I've learned a great deal of respect, respect for all things, and all people. I never take what isn't mine, and live my life with honesty and truthfulness. I am still searching for myself, though I'm not looking for anybody to make my path for me. I wanna smile and laugh and have fun. I'm smart and pretty decent with serious conversations as well. Physically. I'm in very good shape. I'm kinda tall 5, 8, yet small, only 126 lbs. Every night I exercise and secretly dance. I love music, it's my great escape. When I was free, my greatest addiction was being a thrill seeker and although this holds no danger for me, it's a till a risk. 
I'll end with something Axel Rose sang, I'm still alright to smile. Here is an excerpt from an article by Tom Morozik, Los Angeles Times. October 28, 1992. Three people were arrested in a torture murder case in which no body was found after they admitted and in several instances bragged about their roles in the crime, it was revealed in court Tuesday. A preliminary hearing is being held to determine if the three should stand trial on murder charges for killing Irene, Melanie, May and June, 1988. In addition to attacking her with a knife, a screwdriver and a frying pan, they allegedly injected the victim with battery acid. Richard L. Cooksey, a district attorney investigator with the Metropolitan Homicide Task Force, testified Tuesday that Mark Lee Tompkins, 29, Carrie Lynn Dalton, 39, and Cheryl Ann Baker, 28, implicated themselves in the murder in a mobile home in the isolated East County community of Live Oak Springs. According to one of his acquaintances, Tompkins explained how the three planned to give May a fatal injection in retribution for stealing some items belonging to Dalton, Cooksey testified. Tompkins said the victim was given electrical shocks and then a skillet was used to smash her knees, according to the statement given by Donald McNeely. The body was cut up and the parts were buried on two Indian reservations to make it hard for police to obtain search warrants, Cooksey quoted McNeely as saying. Dalton and Baker also allegedly admitted to other people their role in the killing, according to the evidence. Municipal Judge Lawrence Sterling is expected to decide if the three should stand trial in Superior Court at the conclusion of the preliminary hearing. 